Um, the share screen's all there. Um, Haley, I don't know if you wanted to introduce Sarah or Sarah, if you were going to do that or. I mean, yeah. I don't want to introduce them myself um, if, if y'all want me to. Um, uh, hello, friends. Uh, I am uh, Sarah Lamb. I'm a fifth year PhD candidate now and uh, in the program. Uh, so uh, I'm excited to be here because um, Haley approached me a couple of weeks ago saying that the program wanted to have um, somebody or some PhD students come and talk to y'all about research. And so this is really cool for me to um, get to like, talk to all of y'all because our worlds are so se separated that there are many of you that maybe don't know me and there are certainly a lot of you that I, that I don't know. So anyways, I'm just really pleased to be here today and I'm so delighted that um, y'all are giving me some space to do this. Um, yeah, um, yeah, so I'll just go ahead and start. I guess that's enough of a background. If y'all have more questions, we can just take them as they come. I'm gonna attempt to share screen without fumbling. So here we go. Um, okay. All right, so is everybody seeing my slides? Okay. I don't see anything. Oh, golly, y'all. Oh, hold on. <clears throat> there we go, we can see it now. Better, okay, great. Well, so now the rub is that I have never, presented with Google Slides before. So I'm gonna have to pull my slides up to get the notes because I don't see that my notes under here, which is kind of, oh, there we go, just kidding. Great. Okay, so um, so I was asked to come again like and talk to you guys about my PhD research. And um, so before I do that, I'd like um, to sort of touch um, on the things that I studied in my master's, um, if only to sort of show you that like, research interests can change and evolve very dramatically between like periods in your life or places with you that you study or like with whom and like most importantly like you as yourself as you're learning and growing and so for me the interest uh today um and this talk that i'm going to give about managed retreat in hampton roads is um you know something that was sort of rooted in my uh first year studying landscape architecture at Mississippi State University. Um, I was a love, I had a leveling year. So like right out the gate, I was a, a fine art sculpture uh, undergrad that was trying to figure out, I mean, everything. There was so much jargon. I was so lost there in the beginning, but, you know, just trying to figure out my journey in landscape architecture. Um, and so, you know, this is the, this is the title of my master's thesis. And really I was studying um, green infrastructure in their performance. And like, I kept asking like, why, you know, what's it for? Um, at first I thought it was just, you know, like a cool technology. Um, you know, in the case of green roofs, we've got plants on structures. There are so many um, wonderful things that they, they do. And uh, in our case, uh, the professors had asked me to study what birds were doing there because on their set of test roofs, they kept noticing that birds were using the roofs and they wanted to know exactly how. Um, they wanted me to know specifically though, if there was a difference between like the native planted roofs and the sedum ones. And so like spoiler alert, there was no significant difference in our roof types, which, you know, it's a little bit of a bummer, but useful. Um, and so, um, you know, while I was studying this topic, I kept circling around this notion of um, ecosystem services, right? Like I kept wanting to push more and find out more about how and why green roofs support bird habitat and how that impacts people. And so, you know, that was back in 2011 when I started studying um, green roofs for bird habitat. And, um, you know, fast forward to today where I am, you know, here and, uh, you know, so like before we go any further, I wanted to just bring one definition in and it's kind of a long one, um, but it's a good one. Um, that way we can kind of all start with the same like knowledge base. And so, you know, ecosystem services are the conditions and processes through which natural ecosystems and the species that make them up sustain and fulfill human life, right? Um, <clears throat> everything about the world that we live in and the ecosystems that we enjoy um, are really just this like complex, you know, web of um, place and 
uh, you know, biota, so like plants and animals, and then these like um, processes, natural processes, right? And, you know, all of these functions, you know, produce services or disservices that affect human health and well being. And the author that I've cited there is um, Gretchen Daly. And she's a professor at Stanford University. She's also the director of the Natural Capital Project, which is, um, well, she herself and her, her team are like widely cited as like an authority on ecosystem services globally. And like at its core, what they do is support research about um, bringing the value of ecosystem services into conversations about making decisions in the landscape and like how we approach development or conservation and everything in between. Um, their goal uh, is to like improve the health and well-being of human beings and our environment by like inspiring people to like care and then in turn like invest in ecosystems, right? And so like with this definition in mind, it, like I'm asking like, you know, why is this really important? And the reason why is because, you know, our climate is changing, right? Um, the ability for our natural systems to do their work depends on the quality and quantity of the natural system. Um, another famous ecologist, um, Ann Winston Spurn, you know, talks a lot about how larger plot sizes are better, right? So like that's a big key concept with ecosystem services argument is that like bigger patches are gonna provide more services than smaller ones typically. And the healthier a system is, um, the greater its capacity to like provide those services for us versus weakened ones or ones that have been degraded. And so regardless of the quality or quantity, the national, uh, natural processes are going to occur, right? Like wildfire, for instance, is vital to forest systems and their health. But when you have whole regions that are becoming hotter, drier, and more prone to fire, you're gonna get more fire. And especially if that fire has been suppressed for generations, right? Um, which is something that we're, we're seeing seasonally here in the United States. And, you know, I'm sure you can think back to recent wildfire fire seasons that were, you know, quite catastrophic. And, you know, like what makes these kinds of disasters so bad to us, you know, is the fact that we have developed heavily in places where we actually need natural buffering. And <clears throat> so I just put up a couple of images here for y'all to look at. One's wildfire, you know, one's uh, glacial retreat. You see like ocean pollution, right, which doesn't necessarily just come from coastal communities. I mean, we're talking about rivers of plastic flowing into the ocean in some cases and um, widespread deforestation, you know. All of these things at the granular level, you know, seem pretty insignificant, but when you like add them all up, the um, implications are quite significant. So uh, one of the things that, I, that I'm really interested in particularly is, you know, coastal development and what climate change and how climate change is happening in coastal areas. And so, you know, think about it, like where do people, especially maybe wealthy people wanna build their million dollar luxury homes? I mean, right on the water, like where the fun is, right? Where all the good stuff is. And anyways, like this may seem like really great for people in, in a moment and it's an economic driver and there's lots of reasons to, you know, want to live on the coast. Um, but like over time, like this land may be sinking, the tidal floods are going to become worse as sea level rises, you know, and there's lots of problems that are associated with coastal development for these reasons. And um, this picture in particular is actually from Virginia Beach, um, which is the air, part of the area where I, I study. And, you know, these property owners, um, not today, maybe today, but like sometime soon, you know, as the land is sinking and these waters continue to rise, they're going to have some really tough decisions in front of them, right? Um, it might happen really quickly. So this is an image from uh, Hurricane Dora that hit um, Florida, right? And it's an example of how like storm surge can undermine a beach and snatch foundations right up from under homes, which is like one way that it can happen. Um, another is through flooding events, right? And so like this image is, is is not like a tidal flood event. This is just a, like a like a river flood, but it illustrates the point that like eventually, you know, the waters may not recede, you know. And so what we're talking about here is a migrating coastline, and the thing that I'm starting to ask questions about and like really explore is how do we deal with this phenomenon, right? Like, 
if the coast is moving and we've built up to the edge of the water, you've got millions of people around the globe that are either already standing in ankle deep water, right, or worse, trying to figure out what to do, or you've got people that are just barely upland that maybe don't realize yet that the water is coming, right, and there's this pressure. And just because um, I believe in like mixing things up so that it stays interesting and y'all stay awake, I and because Zoom fatigue, fatigue is real, uh, I found a short little hype video about wetlands and their value to sort of illustrate my next point and sort of give us a common starting point, sort of like a maybe like a review video. Because um, like I don't know how much or little any of you have studied ecosystem services or wetlands specifically um, economics. So, um, so without any more, I'm going to show you this video. Uh, it's not a Virginia video, it's a Texas video. So just bear with me here. There's lots of similarities between the two places. Um, but I think that it's important to sort of like set a, a groundwork for like where I'm going with this talk. So, all right. Are you tired of how land is just so dry and firm? Things too wet for you? What if there was some in-between place that had the best of both worlds? Well, good news, it exists in a utopia known as wetlands. Wetlands are low-lying areas of land where water settles, gathers, and stays at or near the surface of the soil. Wetlands are kind of an in-between place for water. If water runs off, then it's just regular old land, but if the water's too deep, then it might be a pond or a lake. Wetlands come with some really great benefits. Wetlands collect flood water, help stem the flow, and slowly release it so it doesn't do so much damage. And in fact, for this very reason, developers who convert wetlands for human use are now required to offset their impact with water retention systems. Wetlands save up to $30 billion a year in flood-related repair costs in the United States alone. Wetlands are also a great nursery for wildlife. Up to 43% of North Americans' threatened or endangered species depend on wetlands for survival in the early stages of their life. Wetlands are rich in nutrients and increase the food supply all the way up the food chain. Wetlands also act like a huge filter for our water. Within wetlands, there live lots of bacteria and other microorganisms that are continually breaking down matter. In addition to organic matter, wetlands trap oil, nitrogen, phosphorus, sewage, and other pollutants. Wetlands save cities and towns up to $1.6 billion a year in cleanup costs to water supplies. But the economic value of wetlands hasn't always been recognized. People who drained and filled wetlands in the past felt they were reclaiming the land for more useful purposes, like cropland, pastures, roads, homes, businesses, waterways, canals, and reservoirs. In the time between 1780 and 1980, 52% of the wetlands, or more than 7 million wetland acres in Texas, were lost. That's nearly the acreage of Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, and San Antonio combined. If you value wetlands, make it a point to visit them and get involved in protecting them. Your visitation adds economic value to these special places and helps protect them for future generations. Are you tired of how land is? All right. So, um, right, wetlands. Ah, they're so wonderful. And honestly, um, it is, you know, evident to me and a, and, a, and a passion of mine now to think about how like wetlands are key um, to like saving our coastlines and our communities and our ecosystems. And so like, how do we get there, right? Um, lots of hard work, education, policy revisions, support from stakeholders, continued research, innovation, science everywhere. But like, how do we really do that? Like how, we have to be very specific about the things that we're talking about with respect to um, our natural environment and how that links to human health and well-being and um, economics, um, because that's just the type of a market value uh, uh, system of like economy that like we live in, right? So when we're talking about these things, um, we have to be really specific, and that's why I mentioned ecosystem services before, because. Um, you know, ecosystem services are the way that we talk about the benefits that we receive from natural capital, which is our ecosystems, our wetlands, 
our you know forests like all all the things all of it and so this graphic right here comes from the millennium ecosystem assessment and i just wanted to flash it up here you know briefly to kind of show you like how complex it's a very simplified but like how complex these relationships between our environment and people are um, and so like that's a big part of like what i'm what i'm thinking about and working on and you know particularly on the coast you know putting a value to these ecosystem services and like um like based on what these are um how much money they generate or like cost you know maybe to restore you know all of these things matter you know because like it costs money to restore wetlands it costs money to fix roads and you know people individuals and private um, landowners that are right there on the on the coastline you know they have budgets and you know so do cities um and so um and so that's really um sort of like core to like to what what i'm trying to to, to figure out here the um the topic my topic specifically you know is has been looking at how sea level rise and tidal flooding um functions as a climate disaster you know i've been looking at what's happening on the virginia coast in the hampton roads planning district um, Mente uh, got me hooked up with uh, Shereen Hughes of Wetlands Watch. Um, I'm sure most, if not all of you, are familiar with, with her and that nonprofit. They do great work about protecting wetlands. Um, you know, and so uh, through my conversations with her, I was thinking about managed retreat because we were talking about this notion of like buffers around wetlands. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay Protection Act mandates we need a 100 foot buffer around our waterways. And so that means that like everywhere that we can, we've created or are in the process of creating these buffers. And so as private landowners like move away from shorelines, you know, it becomes an issue, uh, I guess for prospective buyers anyways, if they don't check out whether or not the property they're interested in is within this protected wetland buffer zone. So like as people move out, the buffers are supposed to get created and um, anyways, so like this notion of like creating buffers and sea level rise and what happens as the water goes up is that the buffers roll back and, um, and this is a, this concept of like coastal migration, um, you know, is core to, to managed retreat, right? And managed retreat is a word that I've used a lot, but now I'm going to actually define it and talk about it a little bit more because it's one of many, um, adaptation strategies for climate change. Right. And so in this graphic, you can see that there are like four big bins here, protect, accommodate, attack and retreat different ways that we can re respond to um, climate change and disasters. And um, there is significant like overlap, you can see like in this graphic and even within any municipalities like uh, climate response. Right they're going to use combinations of these things. There's there's no it's not necessarily like an all or nothing thing, right? And so managed retreat is the purposeful coordinated movement of people and assets out of harm's way. And um, let's see, I wanted to give you an idea. Uh, I wanted to show you something to give you an idea of like how managed retreat is happening in the United States. And so this is a, a map that was generated by FEMA, um, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, and so uh, the original didn't come with a, a legend, so I'm just going to describe what you're seeing for you real quick. The large circles are communities who have relocated together or are considering relocation. Um, stars indicate academic studies and reports. Um, and then what about the squares? That's not in my notes here. I copied the uh, caption from that picture to describe it, but it's not super clear. Anyhow, you can see on this map that managed retreats happening, you know, all over our country. And um, in Hampton Roads in particular, um, managed retreat is part of the long-term planning for climate change response. Um, for the most part, it involves critical infrastructure, you know, that's gray and blue-green infrastructure. And so real quick, I'm gonna walk you through what's happening in Hampton Roads so you can then kind of get like where I'm going with um, talking to marginalized communities, which is coming up. Um, so yeah, so there's two types of resilient strategies, the gray ones that are typically construction, and then the blue green, which is like land and water base. So in the past, we just talked about green infrastructure because we're talking about terrestrial systems, but more and more, we're talking about blue and green um, infrastructure because, you know, these benefits and these 
things don't stop when land meets water. I mean, there are marine um, habitats and things that help with the managed retreat and with the benefits we receive. So um, um, uh, the strategies in Hampton Roads, there's 11 of them. One is acquisition, and that's where uh, the municipalities are buying homes from um, property owners. And then once those um, properties get taken up, there's a desettlement and then a buffer gets created and we're moving towards restoring ecosystems. Beach nourishment, um, pumping in sand from somewhere else to build up a beach. Uh, there's lots of implications ecologically, but this is one way to soft armor and protect development. Um, the picture on the right is from Virginia Beach, actually. So you can see like what our coast is actually doing. Um, drainage improvement, you know, just trying to help water get where it's going faster, more efficiently. You know, that's a problem with flooding is the, the increased residence time of the water. So um, you either have like constructions that are piping the water away, or maybe you're increasing capacity by creating stormwater parks. This is a stormwater park in Minneapolis, um, but it, it had a nice look to it. So I wanted to share to give you guys uh, um, an example. Uh, another uh, strategy is to just make the buildings move them up, you know, lift them up off the ground. Um, sometimes this also improves wet or dry proofing structures and pumps. Uh, of course, there's green stormwater management. Um, tons of strategies, lots of ways to do it, but basically it's about using, you know, the land to filter stormwater to increase cap capacity and function like a sponge. Uh, there's natural shoreline management, which is a soft armoring technique that lets us uh, keep an ecological um, connection with the water. So there's no hard cutoff between land and water. And so in this case, what you're seeing are uh, modular blocks that have been placed right at the uh, low tide elevation. Behind that sediment is allowed to be trapped. Sometimes they are, and often they are um, planted and then allowed to you know, continue to grow. So right here you see a natural shoreline that has a um, couple of very distinct zones as you get up to the high elevation. Um, this supports wetland migration as sea level rises. Um, another resilient strategy is road improvements. It is important to cities to be able to continue to move people and goods around. You know, So when I was first starting to study this topic, I was like, road improvements, what does that have to do with resilience? But I mean, it makes a lot of sense. You have to have critical infrastructure that's useful, usable. Um, shoreline armoring and protection, um, bulkheads, you know, capping the, the coast to try to protect from wave action. Um, these are costly, they tend to get undermined, you know, there's, they're useful, but of course, with any strategy, there are problems, there can be problems as well. And these are often like in this picture, you know, used in combination. So there's a, there's a seawall here. And then there's also um, aggregate that's been placed at the low, low, low tide mark to kind of break up that wave action. Um, but it severs the connection between land and water. It's a problem. Uh, stream restoration, another wonderful strategy that I particularly love. Uh, it involves lots of different things depending on what kind of a stream you've got, but essentially you're just trying to improve hydrological connectivity, improve biodiversity, and improve structure and function of the system. Uh, structural flood protection is creating things like dams and berms to hold back waters wetland restoration. Uh, this is actually a project that um, happened in, in China, and I wish I could pronounce the name, so I'm not going to at this time, but if you're interested in it, I'd love to send you more information. This actually won the 2010 General Design Award from ASLA because of how they turned an amusement park into a restored wetland and a, and a place that features um, moments where people can really get close to nature. Well, wetlands that are restored um, are just giant sponges for storm water and a buffer for um, storm surge, especially if it's you know uh, right on the on the the coast. So, all of that, circling back to that first graphic that I showed you, um, you see the resilient. This is from the resilience dashboard that Hampton Roads has, and you can see the distribution of all the dots of all the different kinds of projects all over. The, um, the district. There's like over 400 of these. Uh, most of them are not built yet, but they're in the works. And, you know, one of the things um, 
that I started thinking about was like all those benefits, all of those projects, all of those things and functions that each of those projects like do can be translated into a dollar amount. Uh, there's a whole field of research out there that looks very closely at the valuation of ecosystem services. And so uh, like think back to Gretchen Daly and the National Capital Project, they, they do this kind of work. And what I wanted to know was like, who, who decides who gets the money for these projects? Like, who, like how, how does this sort, sort out? Like who, who benefits from the work, these resilience projects? And like right now, uh, the way these decisions get made is generally about like where the critical infrastructure needs are and whether or not they're gonna help the most people most of the time. So like think about having like a big bin to catch as much of the problem in it at once, right? Like that's good. You know, you want a like big, big band-aid, big fix for everything. Um, but while I'm talking about like managed retreat and all of these resilient strategies, you know, what I'm interested in is making sure that more of these projects happen in more places, right? And that not just in the places that help the most people, but in places where there's critical need for people that are the most vulnerable to climate disasters. We all watched a climate disaster unfold this week, you know, like in Texas with the freeze. I mean, we're talking about an event that they just weren't prepared for and there were catastrophic consequences. And in our case with the sea level rise and tidal flooding in Hampton Roads, it may not seem as, um, I don't know, severe perhaps because it's a very slow process, but like it's, it's unfolding as we speak, you know? And so I say all this to say that like, there are folks that are still being left out, right? Of, of receiving the benefits of projects like this. And um, I'm gonna put a pen in that idea briefly um, to talk to you about like what's happening now versus what I'm proposing to do. So Hampton Roads is interested in envir uh, environmental justice, which is great. Right. There's like nine distinct populations, minority, low income, elderly, disabled, um, and, and many more that have been considered in a study that they did to figure out like where projects can do the best, the most good for the most number of people, like I talked about before. All of these measures are based on like medians and like regional averages, right? Um, what I'm asking is what about the people that are gonna hurt the worst when the climate disaster hits them, right? When the flooding hits their property line, when, when they are the ones that are facing the floodwaters. Um, and so that brings me to my research question. So how can managed retreat be advanced by engaging with marginalized communities and exploring tidal flooding and sea level rise as a social ecological phenomena. And I realized I just made a really big leap from the things I was talking about before, but what I was describing before was how we're studying the environment and we're studying these landscape interventions from like a environment benefit and money cost, right? Like it's all about this, the, the physical and, the eco and economical factors. What I'm saying, um, and, and this is a gap that, that I've come across in the literature, is that we're really not exploring how we can address climate change from social and ecological spaces. So instead of putting money first, let's put people in environment first. And so with all that's known about what we can do um, to, to combat climate change, what I'm asking is like, how can we engage with marginalized communities to understand how they're experiencing, understand like what are the barriers and challenges to them getting the relief and, and then getting their needs met and, and then turn that into um, you know, something that can help people make better decisions about where these landscape interventions go down so that we can protect society's most vulnerable um, instead of letting them you know, get flooded out and forgotten, right? This is, uh, something called uh, slow violence, okay? We, uh, it's, a, it's a term that comes from Robert Nixon and his book and a book about environmentalism and poverty. And it's just about the like development of gradual and harmful changes that result from, you know, structures that are like, like societal structures that are ill-planned or um, 
on malice and equitable. So what am I studying, right? I'm showing you now a map of Hampton Roads and you see all of the municipalities outlined. Um, what you see in red is the FEMA 100 year floodplain. And what you see in blue is called, um, it's the CDC's social vulnerability index. And they have a way of measuring by like census data, who are those people that are the most vulnerable, right? And it's those that are in that last 10%. Like the, low, like the lowest, right? And this is important because like the communities that are gonna be hit first and hardest are gonna be the ones that are closest to water, right? And the ones that are getting the flooding that are gonna have the hardest time dealing with it are those that have the fewest resources. So that's why I care about the marginalized communities because we need to figure out how we can take these vulnerable people that are vulnerable, whether it's for their social class or race or socioeconomic status or whatever, how can we be intentional about trying to undo some of the, the policies or, or not necessarily the policies, but you know, the, 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 where they've ended up in the landscape is the result of policy, right? Land use, um, housing markets, all these things. And how we help them and pull them out, you know, or like manage the retreat of these people is an, a question of um, social equity, you know, because usually the people that get um, with these acquisitions and the buyouts, you get paid like a fair market value for your property. Well, what if you live in an underappreciated area and you're getting offered money to like move out of your house, but there's nowhere for you to go that allows you to still have your same like social networks that you depend upon. You're, you know, close to your work, close to your daycare if you need it, close to schools, close to resources. Um, I mean, these are all social justice issues. And um, unfortunately, I don't think we're spending enough time talking about how this actually worked, right? Rich people, well-connected people can afford to bear more risk and poor and socially isolated people just aren't. Um, so the intersection, so the, the population that I'm talking about is the intersection of what you see on this graphic, right? It's where are, the people the most vulnerable which is blue and then the red where is the flooding happening right and so i've zoomed in a little tighter for just like a, a just a, a random neighborhood in the hampton roads district and what you see here is again that fema floodplain now you see the buildings outlined in green um everybody here is except for that top corner is part of that sbi 90th percentile and i just you know, did a did a GIS, um, you know, action to like turn the structures yellow, right, where they intersected with the floodplain in this area. All of that is sort of like a proxy for like the address points and the households of the people that are in these places. And depending on like where you are in Hampton Roads, the kind of flooding and how like where it happens and to the degree the extent of it is going to be different. So here's another neighborhood same scenario, right? 90th percentile, tidal flooding, um, buildings that are in harm's way, people, people, families that are in harm's way. And it's very different than that previous slide. And then here's another, um, here's a creek that floods between two larger water bodies. And you can see, and maybe it's suggested by the shape of some of these buildings that we're talking about apartment complex blocks and things. So like higher density areas. And, you know, like these are the people, these are the stories that I think are worth um, telling and, and asking about. Like these, these folks that are dealing with flooding day in and day out, finding out from them what it's like, how does it impact their life, what are their needs? You know, I think that that's a very important um, story that's not being told and something that should be emphasized if we're going to try and move forward in a, in a better and more equitable society. Um, and again, here's one more. This one is actually just off of uh, an estuary in an industrial zone. So you have lots of like shipping and things and in industry on the right side and those big buildings. And on the left is um, low income housing. And, um, you know, what are all these people gonna do when the waters come up? I mean, these are big questions. Um, and so I'm just gonna kind of close and maybe open up for questions now. Um, 
with this quote by um, a, a scholar from Canada who I really admire, um, you know, she talks about how the minority vo voice is the most important in her culture because it's the most likely to tell you what's growing wrong, you know, and what they're not looking after doing or acting responsibly toward. And so I actually have that written in pencil on a thing right above my computer. And like when I get really down about my research or just frustrated because I'm, you know, circling around something and I can't figure it out. Like I keep looking at the, these words and they kind of inspire me to keep pushing forward because I do, I do really believe that like, um, you know, the next hundred years is gonna be super important for um, how we reimagine our country, other countries reimagine, you know, their coastlines and their development. And, you know, I think that we have an opportunity to like rise up and take care. So anyways, um, with all that being said, um, you know, thanks for, I guess, listening to my uh, talk about my topic and like the kinds of research questions that I'm looking into. Um, I see Haley turned her camera back on. Thanks, girl. Um, I will invite uh, anyone to like, ask questions or, you know, if I made some large leaps and you want some clarification, I'd love, I'd love to hear from you. So, so thanks. I have a question. So you talked all about um, just a number of different infrastructure improvements that um, can be made and are being made. Do you think that governments are investing more into ones that are less effective or do you think that there are um, methods that you that um, should be invested more into? Haley, that's a really great question. And I appreciate you asking it. Um, yeah, I've actually was sort of tasked with like, with like looking deeply at how, at least in Hampton Roads, um, they're approaching their projects, right? And um, one of the things that I was able to tell through like this like study is that like over time, it, it looks like we're leaning more towards like blue green strategies. However, road improvements are never not going to be a thing, right? Neither are drainage and um, drainage improvements. Um, hopefully, you know, uh, municipalities will start using green stormwater management more often than the constructed, you know, methods. But, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, in a lot of cases, yeah, I think it comes down to the, be the better price, right? But like what people maybe aren't thinking is like, you know, being penny wise today is going to be a pound short in 20, 30, 50 years, right? So, um, you know, you might make, um, you might, you know, you know, not want to do a more expensive, um, you know, blue green project, perhaps because the price tag is high, but like at the end of the day, like that's what's going to protect all of the community, like over time, you know, to have those buffers well established and have those, those water sinks everywhere. Um, so that when the next hurricane right rolls in or like whatever the the natural it, it could just be raining right like just a big heavy storm or just tidal flooding you, you know you have to have spaces to take care of that as it comes right and so if you choose projects that don't address that then you're just kicking the can down the road you know so i think that the projects are leaning more towards the blue green strategies you know but they're, you're never not going to see probably road improvements as like the number one dollar you know, item that they're spending money on. I mean, that's just a guess. Yeah, thank you. I always wonder because um, I see a lot of just houses being raised. Um, and I think it's, you know, a great strategy in terms of keeping communities together and letting people stay where they're at. But I also always wonder how effective they're going to be as um, just like flood levels continue to rise. Yeah, I mean, it probably gets to a point where like you, um, <clears throat> yeah, so like there's a, there's a, there's a place in, in South Louisiana, right? There's a, it's um, Bayou St. Charles, Isle St. Charles. Oh, I'd have to look it up. I apologize, I apologize to y'all. Anyways, it's, it's an indigenous community that's basically a bunch of, um, houses on stilts on a barrier island out in the marsh and the waters are rising up and Louisiana government like offered them money to like 
relocate. And a lot of people did, but a lot of people had such deep place attachment and rightfully so that they didn't want to move, you know, and like, it's completely cut off. You can only get in and there out of boats. And a lot of these places like utilities get cut off because the municipalities can no longer afford to like service them and keep them up, you know? So yeah, you can raise buildings, people can stay, but eventually you have to have a hard decision in front of you. And, you know, maybe it doesn't happen in your lifetime, but it, it might, and then it will for the next perhaps. So, um, yeah, I see an interesting comment in the chat from Marcel. Thank you. He says, they say, uh, they say there's an article about how globally regional war will be started because coastal communities will have to move inland and will have nowhere to go. Uh, thanks, Sam. Um, right, M Marcel, that's a great comment. Um, I mean, I haven't read that article, but you know, there's no doubt going to be tension between coastal communities and upland communities. I mean, there's already tension, but like as you know, time goes on, there's going to be more pressure applied, right? So. Let's hope that it doesn't go to war. Let's hope that we are in a place <laughs> socially where we can we can, you know, solve our problems without violence. You know. Um. If you're too afraid to talk on the Zoom, I would welcome any anyone to type in the chat too. I'm looking at that as well. Sarah, I have a question. Hi, Paul. Um, First of all, thank you for sharing your work with us. It's really nice to hear the passion you have for it. And it's really impressive. You also did a really nice job of presenting kind of the breadth of the problem. And, the, and I can imagine that you've inspired a lot of people to want to make change, but at the same time intimidated them because it can seem so overwhelming. And given that um, all research comes down to narrowing it down to something that you can act in some way to contribute. I'm wondering if you can share maybe how you're, what you're actually doing within this framework. How have you narrowed it down? Uh, you talked about the voices of the people that are most vulnerable. Are you, are you recording? Are you interviewing people? Or are you, how are you operating in a way that you can share so that the students can see how they might also have a way into the dealing with the problems. Oh yeah, Paul, that's a, that's a great question and I'm glad you asked it. Yeah, so um, if I'm being honest with everyone here, I am in this sort of uh, in betweeny period where I'm working on uh, my proposal and prospectus where I'm writing at like exactly what it is my study is gonna be. And so that's something I've spent a lot of time thinking about and writing about right now. And um, it is my intention to you know sample those households and um, for a survey just like kind of a basic uh, covering. Um, let me pull up this other thing here and I can kind of tell you more about it. Um, but sort of asking them about their experiences, like their physical experience in the landscape of the flooding, like what are the things they've maybe noticed, uh, their impacts on their um, their properties, like the infrastructure, like our thing, like where's the water coming up to, like how is it harming buildings or, you know, killing plants, I don't know, undermining the shore. Um, I want to ask these people about um, like what they know about hazard mitigation and adaptation, you know, to sort of identify like if, if there is something that um, is missing there. Um, and also I'm interested in sort of their place attachment factors because I think that that will matter when we get to like later, later parts of like the, the work where we're talking about the so what, you know, and a lot of that's going to have to do with people that don't, that, that are connected to place. And um, yeah, and so like this is just a sort of a very general survey to kind of cover like those sorts of things with an emphasis on like the experience of um, sea level rise and tidal flooding. And then um, at the end of that survey, there will be like an opt-in for follow-up interviews where I'd like to do like in-depth um, conversations about the kinds of things they're responding with the, with the flooding. And the way those individuals will be selected is by like flood characteristics. So I'd like to talk to people who have like um, either flooding that like is shallow and lasts a long time or deep and lasts a long time. You know, is it just a tidal thing? Does it only happen in big storms? You know, just different ways of thinking about flooding. And then um, there's another piece where because of like, I'm trying to think through this. Now that we're doing so much on Zoom, right, 
before when I was like taking a qualitative class, it never occurred to me that you could just do an interview on Zoom and then maybe do a screen share and kind of have like a interactive um, piece between yourself and the interviewer. And so it's my thought that maybe there's an opportunity to um, collaborate on some maps where I can like talk to an individual and we can open up a Google map together and they can drop pins about things that have happened or maybe share photographs that they've taken on their property or like if they're driving to work and a road is impassable and they snapped a picture of a, of a landscape condition then like maybe through collecting like the stories and experiences we can tell a different kind of story about the experience of sea level rise and tidal flooding because people are usually not talking to um <clears throat> i mean you want to like i said you want to catch as many people as you can with the solution but there's still going to be people left out so i'm hoping to try to capture that slice you know and um did that answer did that answer your question yeah okay and it's it's consistent with your whole discussion about that it's not just an ecological and an or environmental or economic issue it's a social issue and how do you start to understand those social dimensions of it it's really nice thank you no oh, thank you nice words i appreciate that um, I have a question. Okay. How did you originally like get into this topic and like begin studying it? Like, did something inspire you, or I don't know? I was kind of I really like this subject, and I was curious how you um, got involved with it. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so um, when I was in the second grade, I was invited, my class was invited to a water conservation, like thing for kids that the Mississippi, the state of Mississippi put on and they invited uh, uh, second grade classrooms from all over the state to come to the Capitol to come to the Coliseum to go through all of these different modules and learning about water resources, and ecosystems and protecting the environment. And, and that's when I caught the bug and originally, like I've always wanted and, and like had this uh, like passion towards like the work, the life's work that I do, like having a meaningful impact. Um, you know, fast forward into my um, mid twenties, I'm at Mississippi State looking for, um, well, I had just graduated with my art degree and I was looking for something, you know, professional and something meaningful. And I found landscape architecture and that's when I, you know, got into that study about because the lab that the lab that it invited me to work with them was doing green infrastructure work. And that's when I got interested in ecosystem services through that literature review, I guess, is the most basic way. Cause like no one dangled that in front of me in a class. Like I had to go find it. And um yeah, you know, I, coming to Virginia Tech, you know, that was something I was still interested in. I didn't really know how yet, you know, and like Mente was very kind. Um, to like take me in and as his student and, and CL as well, uh, you know, and sort of like help me kind of navigate this like these ecological questions and like, like, what does it mean? And so Mente and I, I mean, he'll probably tell you better than me, but we bounced around ideas back and forth. I mean, I was looking at streams for a little while. I was looking at residential development configurations and how to measure ecosystem services by like quantifying trees. I mean, like I, I really did kind of like meander and fluff around you know and um it wasn't until like he kept telling me talk to shereen hughes talk to shereen hughes not only is it like a meaning like meaningful work but it's a nonprofit that has money for funding now like they don't fund me yet but like if i can land on something right there might be some dollars there to like help me do some data collection i don't know but talking to a person in industry and a person who is literally like out there trying to do this work um, those conversations are what opened me up to thinking about, you know, ecosystem services, right, in another way, thinking about a practical problem, which is like fulfilling the needs of the Chesapeake Bay Act, right, getting those buffers. Well, what else? The globally, like the climate is changing. And so we have this buffer issue, but we also have rising waters, sinking land, you know, and so, and so that's how, and I hope, Jamie, I'm sort of describing that oh it's so confusing right like because the, the path is like this but you know but that's truthfully how I came across it I just kept pushing and kept like hitting my head on my desk and kept going back to the 
weekly meetings with Mente and trying to communicate what it is right that I'm that I'm trying to search for and then eventually I and I'll be honest uh, I hit a wall I hit a wall in the literature and I just couldn't find an answer that I was looking for and then it occurred to me that I was looking at the gap and the reason why I couldn't find the answer is it wasn't there yet and then I went oh Mente celebration and then you know of course there here we are you know so that's that's how it happened it was very messy it was not a linear process Tell us why, how you came to Virginia Tech after that conference. <laughs> oh, it's such a good story. Okay, so the reason why Mente is my advisor is because um, I was finishing my master's and they, my advisors there were like, you're going to go to CELA, right? The Council of Educators, Landscape Architect. You're going to go to CELA. You're going to give a talk about your master's research. Spoiler, I hadn't actually done it yet, but like the, it was, uh, the study was forming up. I had done the pilot and they like thrust me into this CELA world. We were in Baltimore and um, the last day of CELA was when my session was. And I was put in a room with three other scholars that were like professionals. And I was the first one to go because I was the grad student and I gave my talk and I'm like shaking and I'm sweating and I'm all nerves because I've never spoken in an environment like this before and this one guy is giving me a hard time man like he's asking me these hard questions and he's like pushing me and um turns out it was Mente and like he so he gives me this hard time and it, and it occurred to me that like I want to be a scientist I want to be a serious scientist so I'm going to go work with somebody that like pushes me and make you know he made me sweat you know he made me ask questions I hadn't even thought about. So when it came to choosing someone to work with it at Tech, like it was, it was kind of clear that I wanted to work with Mente and he so graciously accepted me. He didn't know it was me that was applying to work with him at first. We figured that out in the interview. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how that happened. And like, um, yeah, that, that's it. <laughs> so thanks Mente. Boop, boop. <laughs> I don't usually, you know, give that kind of tough questions in conferences. For some reason that day when you presented it, I had a lot of questions. Yeah. Well, there was, there was, it, it rightly so. There were lots of problems with it. It needed to be questioned. So thank you for that. <laughs> it made the work better. Oh, wow. Looks like there's a lot of things happening in the chat. Oh. All right. Sam says, would love if you could share some thoughts about communities who stay in place. Fifth year, looking at Chesapeake. Okay, rising floodwaters in the neighborhood and wetlands watch, Living River Trust. I get lots. Yep, acquisitions, totally. Okay. Hmm. Okay, so the question is, do I find this strategy happening in more places throughout Hampton Roads? Yes, there's a couple of like little clusters. Um, the one in Chesapeake that y'all studied is the biggest of them, um, but there are more. And then there's, of course, like, you know, scattered ones around. Um, it's kind of gaining traction. I think it's more, it's, a, it's not like they have been doing it as long as others. Your second part of your question, if so, how do these community conversations happen with people, specifically those who choose to stay in place? Sam, that's a great question. Um, I, I don't know how it's happening in Hampton Roads yet. I'm hoping that that can be part of what my research addresses, you know, I think that um, I probably need to talk more to Shereen Hughes and other, um, you know, pe people in Hampton Roads that are like doing the work to find out like more specifically and more intentionally how those conversations are happening. Um, you know, so yeah, like, I don't, I don't know. I wish I could tell you, but it's a great question. So thank you for that. I'm going to borrow that question. I think it's an important one for me to talk about. Um, and then we found that this was the case with a few families in this specific neighborhood in Chesapeake. So yeah, maybe, do you have, do you want to share something about what y'all learned in your studio, Sam? I'd love to hear it. Sorry, I'm at work right now, but um, we, I think um, we obviously didn't get to go on a whole studio visit to Chesapeake, which would have definitely been really nice to connect more with the community, but with this specific project, I know that Shereen was saying that their next step was kind of going to go to the community. So I was just wondering if there had kind of been any maybe progress with that, either with that project or with other projects throughout Hampton Roads, but I was curious. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure yet. 
I don't know about that. My, I, I mean, that was definitely something that I was thinking about before, but then, you know, going through the process of like preparing for the prelim, doing the prelim, trying to do the proposal, like actually answering those questions have kind of taken, you know, back burner to sort of the process of like developing a, like a study that's doable, right, and manageable. Um, but I think that's a great question. And it's going to be important everywhere. And it's going to be different everywhere, too, because people are different. Communities are different. Even within Hampton Roads, one answer, one solution for one neighborhood is going to be unique to, to, you know, everyone's, you know, everyone's going to have their own way of needing to respond to the crisis, I think, and place attachment, you know, issues. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing all of that. I think we have time for maybe one more quick question if anyone has one. Oh, Susan says Marcel has a question about Sam. Sorry. Um, okay. What are some of the major sources of funding for these types of projects? Is there a potential in the future for large masses of funding towards wetland restoration? Okay, I think Marcel that Mente kind of hit on this a little bit lower. Um, saying like the, the FEMA has um, funds for um, like moving people out of harm's way and then like land trusts have managed retreat funding but like you know so there is money out there um, to, to, to tap into widespread we can only hope you know I mean I think that's kind of the problem right now is that the pot of money is this big and the problem right <laughs> it's you know so so like deciding like where you take like what money and what resources are, are available and how you spread that out is like a is like a big issue because you know at the end of the day like even though we care about people in place like money seems to always be this bottom line right so navigating that is, is a real it's going to be a continue to be an issue especially as inflation continues right or whatever happens with the economy Sarah, um, I'm going to actually, I think I'm going to email you because towards the point you keep making about the issue of the money pot not being large enough or not being able to be mobilized or organized in a way to solve these problems, I did an independent study. I mean, I'm continuing to do an independent study kind of in my own time um, about monetary systems and how that alternative monetary systems and ways of thinking about what money can be mm -hmm. can help mobilize these kind of projects that you're talking about. So I am very much interested in the economic side of things. And I have some really cool books that I that I could send you if you're interested. It, it might, like, I don't want to uh, widen the scope of what you're doing <laughs> anymore. But I think that there's a lot of interesting conversations that we can have about this. So I'll send you an email. Yeah, that would be great, Alexander. I really appreciate it. And I'll actually um, put my email in the uh, in the chat um, for anybody who might want to get connected. But yes, I, I I really appreciate your comment. And yeah, I mean that's a, that's a that's a piece that I do have to to write about. You know, so if you have interesting leads or like probing questions, thoughtful thing, you know, like I would I would love that because it's only going to make the work better. You know, so thank you. All right, right, um, right on time. Thank you so much again, Sarah, for sharing with us your research and sort of your journey into research. I think it's been um, really insightful and it's been great hearing from you. Yeah, well, thanks everybody for your time. And um, I hope you have a lovely uh, rest of your afternoon. And um, even though no one ever sees me because I don't leave my house, um, I'm here, I'm around, and I invite anyone to reach out. And it's been lovely seeing, you know, all of you, even if it's just your names. So, all right, well, uh, with that, I'm gonna, bye-bye. Very nice, Sarah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much.